For the Journal Club today, we're going to focus down on a paper by uh, Sir McFarlane Burnett from 1957. And this paper is a very, very important paper. It's probably the best, the most important paper in the whole 20th century in immunology. And, um, and hopefully I will be able to explain why that is. Um, the title of the paper is A Modification of Yearney's Theory of Antibody Production Using the Concept of Clonal Selection. It came out in the Australian Journal of Science. And it's just two or three, it's three pages long. And so everybody ought to read this paper and co commit it to memory. Uh, it, it's, it's really a tour de force. What he did in this paper was, and, and he did a whole bunch of things, which I'll, I'll talk about. But in, in my mind, the most important thing that he did was that he gave the immune system, which up until that time had been immune reactions as, as determined by antibody formation, appearance in the, in the blood. But nobody knew where they came from, what they were, and how it all, how the, the system really worked, what the, what really what the cellular basis of this whole business was. And to me, that's, that's the most important part about this paper. For the first time, it was, it basically was a hypothesis paper. So it wasn't, you know, tried and true and um, written in stone. But for the first time, there was a rational hypothesis that explained all of the, all of the uh, data and all of the experience that everybody had had essentially for, for 50 years um, from the early part of the, of the 20th century. And so a little bit about uh, Burnett. He was born in 1899. So right at the turn of the century. And um, as I said, I think before when we talked about Metawar, so he was, Metawar was born in 1915. And so Burnett was 16 years older than Metawar, just to give you a time frame of, of, of these two guys. And he went on to medical school. And of course, the, the flu epidemic of 1918 was a huge influence on the, the whole world because 50 million people worldwide died during that epidemic. And that's just an estimate, it's probably a hundred million. They didn't have such good record keeping. And, we, and today, <laughs> it's about the same today with coronavirus. But anyway, I, there were only about two, two and a half billion people in the world in, um, in 1918. So 50 million was a, about two and a half percent of the total world's population that died of that, of that infection. And of course, it, as I've said before, Nobody knew what a virus was, really. I mean, sub, sub, you know, substance-wise, all they knew was is that it was smaller than a bacteria because it would pass through filters. So it was called a, a filterable agent. So, so that's important for for um, Burnett because of the fact that he he went on to medical school and graduated in his early twenties or in mid twenties and so forth. And so, uh, flu was really the, the, the plague of, of his generation. And for there on after, for the next two or three decades, just about everybody who was anybody interested in, in uh, immune responses and epidemics and, and epidemiology and, and, and uh, infectious diseases was studying flu. And Burnett really, he wasn't an immunologist, even though he's, <laughs> he's famous for putting it on the straight and narrow. And he, he, was, he was really an MD. I mean, and he, and he spent his career studying um, infectious diseases, primarily flu, but also other infectious diseases. And he made several discoveries in flu that were really important. I mean, the, first of all, he, he um, discovered how to grow the virus in chicken embryos, in fertilized eggs, because you had to have cells to grow this virus. And you know, that's how you, you could get more of a filterable agent is to, is to grow it in cells. But of course, at that time, cell culture didn't exist because they kept getting infected with other bacteria, with bacteria all the time. And so in vitro cell culture was not a in, in flasks and in test tubes and that sort of thing, wasn't, wasn't a fun, people just didn't do that. And so in order to be able to grow the virus, they would, um, they would take a virus preparation, maybe isolated from a, from a patient or an individual. And with a hypodermic, with a syringe, they would puncture the, the egg shell, squirt it into the, um, into, the fertile, into the embryo. And they would wait for a while and then harvest the whole thing and they could get more virus out than they put in. And so this is how they, 
how they uh, grew up the virus. And so he went on from there then and, and found that the virus would agglutinate red cells. It was a hemo, something about it allowed it to be a hemagglutinin. Um, and so he used that to develop a quantitative assay for the virus because you could, you could titrate your viral preparation by diluting it and diluting it and diluting it and diluting it. And then you could add red blood cells to an aliquot of each of the dilutions and then look at it under the microscope and you could see the red blood cells agglutinating. And then after a while, as you diluted them out, they, they didn't agglutinate anymore. And so that was the quantitative assay for the, the virus. That was very, very important um, later on in terms of trying to make a vaccine for flu. So, but in addition to that, he used the hemagglutination inhibition assay uh, or the hemagglutination assay to look for antibody activity that would inhibit the hemagglutination. So it would inhibit the virus from making red blood cells agglutinate. That was the hemagglutination inhibition assay. And so now he could study the immune response, which is what he did. And uh, he made all kinds of very fundamental discoveries in the, um, in the 30s and in the 40s and, and, and beyond. So things, things started to get hot in, in the mid 50s. And there were other people that entered into the, into the, um, the quest to try to find out so what are, what are these antibodies? It was the, the paper was really about antibodies and, and what was the source of these antibodies. And so that's what the paper was about. And, and, and really the, 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 the question really was, how could there be so many different kinds of antibodies in the plasma of, of an individual or in the blood? And yet, each, yet there was tremendous specificity. So there was di broad diversity of antibody reactivity in the face of tremendous specificity. And the question was, how can that be? How can you account for that? And that was the, that was the sort of the intellectual puzzle that these guys started to work on. So in the introduction of this paper, um, Burnett goes into, he said, at this point in time, in, in, the, in the mid fifties, there have been three theories that have been uh, proposed to account for antibody formation and this question of specificity in, in the face of broad diversity. Um, the first he talks about was from a person by the name of David Talmadge, who was from the University of Colorado. And I, I, I knew David Talmadge and met him and talked to him. And so now we're starting to get into my generation of people um, in, in this whole business. Um, Talmadge proposed in 1957 as well in, a, in another paper, what, what, what came to be called the direct template uh, theory. And what he proposed was is that antigens served as the template against which the pattern of the antibody to react to the, um, so that was called the direct template theory. And it was a sort of like the the, the good old Italian uh, or the hand in an Italian glove. And so the, the glove sort of fits around the hand and really, you know, the, the um, kid goat gloves that felt so, feel so good. So that was the direct, the template theory, direct template. And then um, Burnett himself, just a year earlier had, had postulated that there, uh, what, what came to be called as the indirect template theory. And he postulated that the, it, it wasn't just a fluid kind of thing that happened when your antigen was added to the, to the antibody molecules. And of course, at this time you had to remember they didn't know what proteins were. They didn't know what globulins were, although they talked about globulins, but they didn't really know what they were. And so it was a little bit hard to conceptualize this whole thing. He said that what Burnett thought was is that, was, is that there, there must, it must be um, programmed in the genes of the individual, the, the, an, the antibody specificity, the antibody um, shape to allow it to bind to an antigen had to have been, had to come, it couldn't be just exist out there in the fluid phase of the blood. It had to have come from someplace and he's postulated it came from our genes. And of course we didn't know what genes were. Well, I shouldn't say that in 19, we've already talked about 1953 when Watson and Crick um, finally um, showed the world that the that a gene, you know, they, they knew that, DNA, the deoxyribonucleic acid molecules were 
um, coded for the genes, but they didn't know how it worked. And they so in 53, they did. Now we're only talking about 57. And so this, this was still just at the beginning of genetics, molecular, molecular genetics. Well, then there was another fellow and that was Niels Yerney, and he's an interesting guy, and we'll, we'll get into him uh, again later. Um, but Yerney was a Dane, and he was a physicist by training and grew up and so forth and so on. But I think he felt that the competition was too great in physics. And so he left physics and went into biology and found himself working on immunology. And he was one of the major influences in the thinking of how the immune system was regulated and organized. And so he came up with a theory that he called the natural selection theory in 1955. So we got Talmage, we got Burnett, we got, we got Niels Yearney. And the natural selection theory was that um, what, he thought, what he thought happened was that antigens and antibodies in the plasma combined and then were, were phagocytosed by phagocytic cells, macrophages, and so forth. And then the antigen was digested, but the antibody that was brought into the phagocytic cells acted as a template for copies to be made, sort of like a Xerox machine, for more antibodies of exactly the same variety. So he thought that the phagocytic cells were the source of antibodies, and nobody really had mentioned a great deal about lymphocytes. And, and you know, if you look back through the uh, I've always uh, said, if you look back through the literature and, and look at the textbooks, as, as um, in 1958, they said the textbooks would say that lymphocytes were sort of these sort of boring cells. They didn't have much cytoplasm. They're mostly nucleus. Uh, nobody really knew what they did. And they, and they didn't think that they have the, the capacity to proliferate or differentiate. They just were, they made up the lymph nodes and nobody knew what lymph nodes were doing and what they were for either. And, and so Dierney missed the mark there by, by his theory of, of natural selection, uh, of the antigen selecting for the antibody and then taking it to a cell so that it would make more copies. But that was critical for Burnett. Um, because Burnett said, you know, the, of these three theories, uh, nobody really has accounted for the for uh, what Medawar had shown back in in 1953, in terms of the tolerance phenomenon. So that if you inject an embryo with an antigen, um, then that that embryo grows up thinking that that's part of himself. It was a self antigen. And, and that led to tolerance then on the part of that particular individual, you could graft skin and do all kinds of things. And so Yerney, or Burnett said, this is really important. You gotta, you have to explain how this tolerance business works. And the second problem that he had with, with all of the different theories that had been proposed at that stage of the game was, is that, was is that <clears throat> other people had shown that antibodies would continue to be produced in an animal long after the antigen had disappeared and been cleared. So it didn't seem to him possible that the antigen antibody complexes and so forth, these other things that both Talmadge and Yerney had proposed were, were, were possible. Um, but he liked the whole idea of Darwinian selection, uh, natural selection in this whole process. What he did was, and he states it bold up right up front, he, he extended Yerney's natural selection theory to clones of cells, which he said in this, and then he, he identified the cells. He said the, the lymphocytes are the cells that are really important. And, I, and they, those cells themselves that are selected produce the antibody and their progeny, the progeny of those cells can go on to continue to make this kind of antibody too. So that's the first thing. So he, he, he firmly said that the lymphocytes were the, were the critical guys that involved in this whole. And, now, and then secondarily, he said that the antibodies that these cells go on to produce are originally on the surface of those cells. No, nobody talked about that before. I mean, it was a totally new concept that, that the antibody was on the surface of the cell so that then if you added antigen, it would bind onto the antibody on the surface of the cell. And that would be the trigger to cause the cell to make huge amounts of antibody. That was slick. And he was right. <laughs> the thing about this paper that I like so much is, is that he was right about just about everything that he proposed. 
And they then went on to be proven over the next 50 years of immunology. The third thing that he said was, is that when the antigen binds to the surface of the lymphocyte, to the antibody on the surface of the lymphocyte, is that that triggers the cell to undergo a massive proliferation. And that really is the selection of the clone. Because if you look in the dictionary about what a clone is, it says, it says that a clone is the asexual progeny of an individual cell. So you don't have a, a sperm and an egg forming the, you know, the, the, the gamete and, and so forth. You have, you have a, a single cell making more of itself, identical twins, just more and more and more and more and more of those guys. And proliferation then becomes absolutely fundamental to the immune response. Because without proliferation of those clones of cells, all those progeny of those of, of these cells, you, you can't generate the immune response, number one, because the frequency of the, of the cells that have the antibody to this particular antigen, whatever it is, let's say it's flu virus, are, you know, like one, one out of 10,000 or one out of 100,000. There's not very many of them before the individual is, is infected with that particular microbe. Uh, it's only after the, the initial, the initial um, interaction between the antigen and the surface of the lymphocyte that has the antibody on the, on the surface, that then you get a, a massive expansion of, of antigen reactive cells. And that's, that then leads to the immune response. And also it then goes on to, to, to lead to the, the, the differentiation of the immune response. And Yerny, Yerny, or I mean, Burnett realized that, I guess, as you know, I mentioned last week, Astrid Fregeus, Fregeus from um, the Karolinska Institute in, in, in 1948, essentially um, showed or, or brought forth a lot of evidence that the cells making the antibodies in, in the body, in vivo, were plasma, plasma cells or plasma cytoid cells because they had a lot of cytoplasm and the cytoplasm stained dark blue uh, in the stains that they used. And, and that dark blue, um, it would, they stained that way because of the RNA in the cytoplasm and the protein in the cytoplasm, which was all antibody. So plasma cytoid cells uh, were making um, the antibody and Burnett was really the first one to put two and two together and say, well, the, the lymphocytes become the plasma cells. That hadn't been, they didn't, nobody knew where plasma cells came from. You know, they could come from mother nature or God or whoever. It could have been already there, but no, the, uh, and, and so Burnett essentially solidified that. And all of these things went into the to the foundation, really the cellular foundation of um, immunologic memory, because the foundation of immunologic memory is uh, is a consequence of the proliferative expansion of all of these lymphocytes that then uh, then undergo differentiation to plasma cytoid cells that then crank out all kinds of antibody. And that's why, you know, you could, which then bind to the antigen and then all uh, magic happens again, we have, that we'll have to go into, um, but that clears the antigen from the, from the system. But then the plasma cells keep on making those same antibodies. And what you do then, what happens, and this is what Burnett said in his paper, is, is that the, the characteristics of the, of the uh, plasma changes as a consequence of the immunization, because now you've selectively expansion, expanded the, uh, the, the, the proportion of antibodies in the plasma that bind to this particular antigen. So it's the whole characteristics of the serum changes. And this is what everybody had been measuring for 50 years uh, in, in the different uh, assays that they had for antibodies. Um, the, in terms of the concentrations of, of the antibodies reacting against their favorite antigen. So that all happened. Um, Burnett went on to say that in order to account for, in order to account for the phenomenon of tolerance, there had to be something going on in the embryo when, they, when the immune system, before the immune system had become mature, that accounted for 
the lack of reactivity after the um, after the embryo was uh, born and so forth and so on. And what Burnett really did, and he states this in his paper, is, is that he, he applied the, the principles of population genetics to the immune system. Nobody had done that before. Burnett was really, he, he was really ahead of his time and he was visionary um, in his thinking. Um, and so he summarizes his, the implications of all the things that he said in this particular paper by saying, in order to get the broad diversity of so many different kinds of antibodies and so forth, that each that the clones of lymphocytes had to have an, um, in their genes, the antibody genes had to undergo somatic mutation. That was also, <laughs> that, was, that was heretical. It was supposed to be that you know, one enzyme, one gene, one enzyme kind of thing is what what was the one protein, one gene, one protein, and it was immutable. It if 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 there was a mutation in that gene, then the for the most part that protein was taken out of the picture, didn't work anymore, and so forth and so on. Secondly, in terms of the implications, he said allograft immunity, or what he called what, homograft immunity, that Metawar called it. So the skin grafts were rejected where Metawar couldn't find any antibodies. Um, Burnett went on to say that that had to be because lymphocytes could cause that rejection without any antibody. Well, I mean, that was, <laughs> that was off the wall. How could you do that? The antibodies were immunity at that stage of the game. And here he's saying that there's a kind of immunity that doesn't require any antibodies. That was the beginning of cell-mediated immunity. He, he also implied that the generation of this broad diversity of antibody reactivity um, and the antibody specificity occurred at random. And the, 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 the animal or the human naturally just made all, all kinds of antibodies. And those were then naturally occurring uh, in, in very, very low frequencies. And there's the clones of cells, the, the, the clones of lymphocytes, also very, very low frequency. But we had the, the, the immune system had the capacity to react to everything in the environment and also to recognize everything in, in the internal environment and not react to it. And that would, that would have been then self-tolerance. Self, non-self self recognition became the sine qua non of the immune system. Pretty neat. <laughs> So he, he goes on, he finally says that this is just a hypothesis. So he didn't call it the clonal selection theory. He said, this is a clonal selection hypothesis. And that then, um, now that we know all this stuff and he was correct and, and all of his, the cellular basis for, for the whole antibody formation and for cell mediated immunity and for immunologic memory and for tolerance and so forth. It, it was up to the ne next generations of immunologists to prove him right for the most part, which they did. And, but then um, the thing that, that, um, that um, Burnett was um, hindered by, hampered by, was the fact that he, he didn't know about T cells versus B cells. He alluded to the fact that there were these other cell mediated immune reactions, but he didn't understand, he didn't know that the thymus was where these cells came from so that they were called subsequently called T cells. And that didn't happen until the, the mid sixties and, and seventies. And we'll, we'll get into all of those things. So he didn't know about T cells and he didn't, the other thing he didn't know about were interleukin molecules. Antibodies were the whole thing in immunology up until that point in time. And he, and so he, he, you know, nobody knew about interleukin molecules um, as to be so important for the regulation of all of these things that the populations of cells would do in responding to, a, uh, to an antigen. I've always felt that was good because then that I found and, and other colleagues found all these interleukins that we could talk about and do experiments on and, and, and find out really how the immune system worked at the molecular level. Burnett did it at the cellular level. It was up to us and others to take it the next order of magnitudes. 
down to the um, molecular level so that we can really understand how the immune system works on the one hand, and then also how to manipulate it therapeutically to either dampen it or enhance it um, and treat immunological uh, disorders and diseases and, and things like cancer and infectious diseases and so forth, um, allergies and autoimmunity and, uh, and that sort of thing, which is what we'll get into uh, next. Um, the interesting thing about Burnett is, is that he didn't stop with just this two or three pages. This, he was planting his, his lance in the ground as to, you know, I'm, I did this kind of thing. And he had these Talmadge and Yerny were breathing down his neck and, and he was trying to distinguish himself from them, um, which he did. And the thing is, the, he, he needed, he needed to, to, um, to know more information and which is the, <laughs> which is the, <laughs> the rallying cry of science in and of itself. You gotta have, you have to do more experiments. So this paper was, was greeted as a, as a, a huge revelation by, by the field. And with only three years, within only three years, Medawar and Burnett went on to win the Nobel prize um, for the Nobel prize was specifically given for tolerance and the phenomenon of tolerance to which Medawar had, had um, provided the experimental data and for which Burnett had, had uh, proposed the theoretical foundation for the whole thing. And so if you go on the Nobel Prize website, nobelprize.org, and then look for the prize in 1960 and read through the biographies of both Medawar as well as uh, Burnett and then read through their Nobel lecture. Uh, it's very interesting in terms of what they said at, at that particular point in time in 1960. And of course, the other thing that was unknown when this paper came out in, in 50, uh, 57 was the genetic code had not been cracked yet. They knew about the structure of, of DNA, finally, the double helix and so forth, but they didn't know how, how the genetic code worked, how the information got from DNA to RNA to protein. And, and so the genetic code wasn't really be, began to be understood until 1961. Uh, and so that's the sort of the where we're working here. And I, the whole 60s and then 70s and, and then beyond, molecular, bio, molecular genetics, molecular biology was really where it was at in, uh, in, in basic fundamental science. Everybody wanted to be a gene jockey, except me. I didn't want to be a gene jockey. <laughs> so I'll stop there. So if you've enjoyed this video, um, please like, subscribe, and sign up for my newsletter, uh, where I'm serializing my new book, which is called The, the Quest for New Knowledge. You'll find a sign-up link below. Hey, thanks again. It's been great.